Mr. Deepak, the topic for today is uh, prevalence of anterior cruciate ligament injuries in female athletes. Why are female athletes more susceptible to rupturing their ACL? Uh, but before we start, just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my full name is Surbhi Date, born and brought up in Pune. Um, I finished my undergrad um, from Ferguson College, Bachelor of Psychology, after which I moved to New Zealand for two years. That's where I completed my postgrad diploma in sport and exercise. Um, gained some work experience with uh, strength conditioning for rugby, strength conditioning for netball, um, uh, strength conditioning for physically and mentally challenged athletes, and a bit of personal training and group fitness. Two years after that, I got back to India and immediately, almost immediately, I landed with a job at Inspire Institute of Sport as a strength conditioning coach for combat sport athletes, uh, namely judo, wrestling and boxing. I am now looking after uh, the judo strength conditioning program over here. I have about 40 athletes with me, 40 judo athletes with me over here, uh, ranging from youth national and international level. Um, alongside, I played a lot of sport. Uh, I've been a national level footballer. I've played international level rugby. And a major reason why I chose to speak on ACL injuries today is that I, I, I injured my left knee while playing rugby. I injured my right knee while playing football. Along with that, I got the opportunity uh, to train with a couple of judokas who went through the same injury. And because of all of this, I got the chance to interact with the top, top experts in the industry. And today I'm just going to share whatever I've learned over all these years. And hopefully you're able to take something away from it. We'll have a question answer session later. Um, before we start, can I just request all of you to join the next video? Facebook has uh, some sort of a technical issue where I can't um, swap from a camera view to a share screen view. To show you the presentation, I need to switch this video off and move on to the share screen version. So I'm going to switch this video off right now. Can I please request you guys to join the next video? I'll see you there. OK, so the topic of discussion today is why are female athletes are more susceptible to rupturing the anterior, anterior cruciate ligament than male athletes. This is a very, very broad topic. Um, it, there's going to be a lot of detail, so I would like you guys to have full attention to whatever I'm going to tell, whatever I'm going to talk about, and we can have a question and answer session later. Quite an interesting topic. I hope you enjoy it. OK, so quick overview of what all I'm going to cover today. Uh, we're going to go through the basics of what a ligament is, what the ACL is, what is the structure and function of the ACL, how does the ACL tear generally, then a couple of injury stats to know how severe the situation actually is, um, then the meat and potatoes, probable risk factors in women and the implications for it, and lastly, the probable solutions to combat the risk factors and reduce your chance of rupturing your ACL or your clients, whatever. OK, ligaments 101. So what is a ligament? Ligament is basically this fibrous tissue uh, that's co that connects one bone to another bone. And its main function is to make a joint. Imagine if we did not have ligaments, we won't have joints at all. We would just be a sack of bones without any ligaments. So it's basically connecting one bone to another bone and making sure it stays in place and it stays stable when we are moving around. If you look at this image, you can see uh, the ligament is quite whitish in color. And that's because it's predominantly an avascular structure. Even over here in the color picture, you can see they, they, you, they deliberately show it white in color because it's avascular in nature, which means it does not get a lot of blood flow. So once it tears, it's very hard for it to rejoin. A doctor will be able to tell you better about all of this. Next, the structure of the ACL. So the ACL starts from 
the anterior part, the front part of your tibia, which is your shin bone, it spirals around itself and attaches deep onto your femoral condyle, which is deep inside your thigh bone. This is the bottom of your thigh bone, which is just opened up in this figure. It also blends in with the with the medial meniscus as it goes up. So generally you see when you tear an ACL, generally speaking, uh, the meniscus also gets damaged to some extent. Um, a fun fact over here, the ACL forms a cross with the PCL, which is a ligament at the back. And because both these ligaments form a cross, that's where they get their name from, cruciate. The anterior, uh, anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament. Next, function of the ACL. What does the ACL do? It basically stops your tibia, it stops your shin bone from going too forward under your femoral condyle, which is under your, under your thigh bone. Along with that, it disallows excess rotation, again, under the femoral condyles. And lastly, it limits your medial and lateral movement of the knee. But that's that's not a big that's not a big function the main function is this the forward displacement the tibia moving forward and the rotation of the tibia next mechanism of the injury how does this injury happen on a generic level there are a lot of mechanisms but this is on an average the most common mechanism that you would find in any research paper so what happens um you're generally trying to change direction or you're jumping and landing down. And when you're landing, you end up landing on a flat foot, which means your foot is flexed, uh, your foot is fixed onto the ground. There's no room for it to move now that it's flat on the ground. Along with that, you're not um, flexing at your knee, at your, at your hip um, enough to dissipate the forces that are coming from the ground. You're staying more erect. Thirdly, your torso is leaning awkwardly sideways, which means it's probably accelerated on one side and you're not able to get it back under your base of support quickly. So your body, body is basically off balance. And because of all of this, the knee takes the pressure and it buckles inwards. And mind you, all of this, this whole process takes less than a second. So imagine this movement, the buckling in takes less than a second and you're out for an entire season, even for 12 months at times. Crazy. Mechanism continued. It's not, not to say that men have a different mechanism. It's just that women um, just exaggerate the positioning a little bit more than men do, like any other thing, I would say. <laughs> if you look at these pictures over here, you can clearly see uh, the difference between this guy's positioning and this girl's positioning. This guy is in a much better position, much safer position, I would say, where he is flexing at his ankle, his hip is flexed, torso is forward, but he's still balanced, and knee is kept away from trouble. If you look at this girl, she's directly diving in with her knee, probably because of her anatomical structure as well, which um, doesn't allow her to keep her knee out. We will look at that later. Next thing, if you can see over here, trunk control. If you look at this guy, he's the trunk is pretty much in control and in balance. Um, he's going to move on one side, but the, the trunk is not going to stay outside the base of support. The trunk is going to move with him. So the trunk sway is much better controlled as compared to this girl who probably already had, had an ACL injury on this leg. Trunk is way out of whack. She's completely out of balance. More chance of getting re-injured, I would say. Okay. Now let's look at a bit of statistics. If you look at any research paper, they would generally say uh, women on an average are more, um, are uh, four to six or even two to eight times in some papers at a greater risk than men, men in the same landing and cutting sports. Like, like I've mentioned before, women are at a much higher risk than men in the same landing and cutting sports. Uh, to get the severity of the situation, 
Uh, let's look at a couple of stats that were done in India. This study was done on athletes in northern India. They basically collected uh, injury data for about 912, not about exactly 912 athletes, and just checked uh, what parts are getting injured. And out of that, they found out that 50% of the 900 were only, only knee injuries. If you dive deeper into that, out of those 50 percent, 86 percent were just ACL injuries. That's a huge, huge number. This is obviously a mix of male and female, but these studies I'm just showing you to un for you to understand how severe the actual situation is, and we need to do something about it. Next study was done on kabaddi players. So these guys basically just collected injury data over a span of four years, and kabaddi being a highly change of direction sport, the results are evident. 90% of the Kabaddi players um, had ACL injuries, solely ACL injuries, which is a large, large number. Um, last study, uh, this study was done on a bunch of athletes in Mangalore, and these were adolescent athletes. And all they did was uh, collected data about how frequently they were getting injured over a season. And as you can see, knee injuries were the highest again. Moving on, we're going to go through the risk factors. Now, the, I've divided the risk factors into two external factors and internal factors. Uh, external factors, you can't really change much. You Yes, you can change a little bit, but that's out of the scope for today, so I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Um, my main focus is going to be on this. Let's just touch and go on the external, i.e. the environmental factors. Okay, type of competition is going to determine uh, the severity of the risk. What I mean by that is if it's a low level competition, the risk is obviously going to be lower and vice versa. If it's going to be a high level competition, risk is obviously going to be higher. Next thing, shoe and surface interaction is going to determine how much friction and torque there is um, acting upon your body. And you need an optimal amount of friction and torque to be able to uh, execute a nice um, and optimal athletic maneuver, which could be which could be your jump, your land, your cutting, dodging a defender, tackling, passing a ball, anything. Um, if friction is too little, you're going to slip. If friction is too high, your chances of injury, friction and torque, sorry. If friction and torque is too little, you're going to slip on the ground. So imagine a slippery surface, as like playing in the rain. If friction and torque is too high, um, the chances of you twisting your knee are going to be higher and weather is going to obviously determine the level of friction and torque acting upon your body. It's been shown in a couple of papers that on um, in summers when the land is, when the field is dry and hot, because of more friction and torque, there have been more ACL injuries reported as compared to playing in winter. Next, we're going to move on to the anatomic factors, the structural factors that um, are quite, quite peculiar in a woman and what can be done about it. First one being the Q angle and the pelvis width. Just going through the Q angle very quickly. The Q angle is basically the angle, this angle, which is formed between your knee joint and your hip joint. And the wider, the higher this angle, the more chances of your knee going into that valgus, into that, into this motion. The wider the pelvis, the more your hip bone is going to pop out, the more pressure on the medial structure of your knee. Same thing if you look at a male, male's pelvis is smaller than a female and generally the Q angle is not as pronounced. Now, what I want to discuss over here is the difference between a woman showing a static Q angle and what is happening in a dynamic fashion. So what I mean by that is I've seen a lot of females who possess a static angle. So when they're standing there, when they're walking, you can clearly see the knees caving in. You can clearly see they have a Q angle. But when they're on the mat, 
judo for example or when they're playing you can see a perfect alignment like this girl like ankle knee hip in perfect alignment knees not caving in what i mean by this is if you have a static q angle and you are not showing it in a dynamic posture this is not going to be a big risk but if you're showing it uh, in a static posture and you're carrying it in a dynamic posture only then only then the q angle is going to be a risk factor for you so make sure you check both your static and dynamic angles next one joint laxity everybody knows women are generally more flexible than men and what does that mean um all the joints are generally more lax than men which means when you're cutting or landing you're not able um to sustain the force so you're not able to hold on to a stiff ankle and basically pivot around the ball of your foot nicely to dissipate the forces to dissipate the torque what happens is you land uh, more on a flat foot which ends up in the torque traveling around around your tibia and the tibia takes the toll it rotates inwards or it translates forwards and then the biomechanical chain upward all gets faltered joint laxity can you really do anything about it not much i would say just do a lot of strength training if you know you are um you are excessively mobile then just make sure that you have control over that excess range of motion if your range of motion is really high make sure you're strong in your full range of motion so do your full squats do your full split squats everything full range of motion nothing half range of motion so that when you're playing when you go into that range of motion your body knows how to get out of it i'm not saying this is going to prevent injury but this is definitely going to reduce the chance of you buckling your knee strength training next point femoral notch acl size and tensile properties this is quite an interesting one so this is basically a male femoral notch and that's a femoral a uh, female femoral notch what has been shown is that males generally have a wider notch females have a narrower notch a narrower notch would mean that the ligament is going to be structurally smaller in size structurally weaker in size and it's shown that the mechanical properties are less tensile of female ligaments as compared to male ligaments along with that there are also theories that um, a smaller notch would cause a uh, ligament impingement close or close to full knee extension a lot of uh, debatable um, articles over here but this is a theory next one body composition and strength differences so generally speaking be it male or female if you have more mass um you are at a higher risk of rupturing your acl why is that because more mass meaning you are you are producing more ground reaction force the ground is sending back more force in proportion to your body mass and along with that if you are weak you are not able to tolerate that force you're going to be at a higher risk if you look at male and female comparison generally speaking females body composition is more fat less muscle greater estrogen levels especially after puberty and conversely in males there's more muscle and less fat and testosterone levels skyrocket especially after puberty if you look at this graph what it says is birth to 10 years so before puberty girls and boys are at the same strength levels but as soon as they hit puberty this is the major difference that takes place females gain more weight because of estrogen men gain more muscle because of testosterone and as a result females generally comparatively get little bit weaker than their male counterparts so what does all this mean if you put two and two together if you have um if you are on the heavier side if you are a heavy female and you don't have a lot of strength uh, to control your own body weight you're going to have a larger chance of rupturing your acl as simple as that what can be done about this 
a very interesting way to combat this would probably be you start with strength training before puberty because at that time there's no estrogen to act upon your strength levels and strength training is actually going to uh, stimulate the female pituitary gland to produce more testosterone and that would actually help in uh, combating the estrogen effect that would happen after puberty so strength training um get your get your uh, youth at least at least strong say before puberty and that will probably help in um, reducing these effects next one hormonal factors so this is also quite a cool but at the same time quite an uncool study um the human acl has mechanoreceptors on it and these sorry the human acl has receptors on it and these receptors are basically sex hormone receptors which means sex hormones bind on to it and cause an effect during ovulation or right before ovulation in a woman there's a huge upsurge of estrogen and relaxin and the main reason for these two hormones uh, to upsurge at that particular point is for childbearing activities these ligament these hormones actually latch on to your ligaments and actually make them lax and that laxity actually helps um in easing a woman's child birth which is actually quite cool but it's not cool when you're a, a competitive female it's actually quite counterproductive um so what can you do about this you know you know now that during period there are high chances that your ligaments are going to be more lax than usual so you have a chance of getting injured how can you combat this um you just have to be prepared prepared in terms of you want to make sure sure you are strong you you uh, weight train regularly you have um enough strength levels to combat that uh, joint laxity and at the same time there are a lot of neuromuscular programs up there in the market which we will talk about later on but maybe if you know you're going to uh, play a tournament when you have your period when when you're on your first or second day maybe make sure you're warming up well you're using these neuromuscular programs in your warm up just to make sure your muscles are firing right your brain is nice and active and you're reducing your chances of getting injured that's all that's pretty much you can do about it talking about neuromuscular factors so we're done with um anatomical factors we're done with hormonal factors uh, which are pretty much uncontrollable now this is where we have a lot of control over neuromuscular factors what do i mean by neuromuscular or rather neuromuscular efficiency is basically the ability the efficiency of your brain to communicate with your ligaments and your muscles and try to keep your joints in a safe position when you're when you're going through a perturbation as simple as that what does that mean say for example i'm side stepping my my knee my tibia joint is going way forward my ligament is going to panic and go oh my god brain you need to fire your hamstring now otherwise your tibia is going to give way and then how fast your tibia your brain is able to send the signal down your hamstring to pull your tibia back that is all about neuromuscular efficiency how are your muscles working how are your muscles reacting to perturbation how are your muscles firing and coordinating when you're playing okay so talking about muscle activation patterns let's start with fatigue that is the probably the most most important risk factor um fatigue is determined by overtraining and how much training you're doing so your training load and your sleep if you haven't slept enough um your your muscle activation your reaction time are going to be slow and there's a lot of research to support this so i'm not going to go too much into detail about this if you're fatigued your reaction time is going to be slow just as a rule of thumb 
one night of bad sleep is not going to do a lot of damage it's generally two or three bad sleeps in a row uh, that increase your chances of getting injured not just acl injuries any sort of injuries along with that you need to manage your training load as well if your training load is too high um you're in a constant fatigue state you're obviously at a higher risk of injuring yourself so look after that factor next one is the quad versus hamstring so generally what happens is in females uh, the quads are much more active and the go to muscle to fire than the hamstrings i'll give you my own example um i was doing nordic curls and i strained my quad tendon i was doing deadlifts ones and i got sore quads deadlifts is an absolutely posterior chain dominant exercise it's supposed to give soreness to your quad uh, to your hamstring and glutes and i got soreness in my quads similarly i used to get soreness in my quads after a sprint session um and sprint session especially upright running you should feel more in your hamstrings and glutes but i was feeling in my quads and i always wonder why and then later on i realized it's just my quad dominance my body just wants my quads to do all the work why is this bad because quads are basically when they're contracting they're pulling your tibia forward and your hamstrings are basically doing the job of your acl they're pulling the tibia back if your quads are firing more than your hamstrings you're obviously at a disadvantage so if you are one of those women which most probably i'm sure you are you need to um reverse this around and work more on hamstring firing versus quad firing this is known as the quad to hamstring ratio if you just google that you'll get a lot of literature on that moving on uh to the next risk factor which is lateral fibers versus medial fibers what do i mean by that so the outside part of your muscles so your lateral hamstrings your lateral quads what happens is it's shown that in women those fire more than the medial fibers what does that mean if your lateral fibers are firing but your medial fibers are not firing it's going to cause your femoral condyle to actually lift off your tibial plateau and expose your acl to more risk so that's a very very important risk factor that you need to address and it can be addressed through strength training through a lot of muscle isolation training through a lot of neuromuscular activation um which we will go through in the later slides and last one is acl sensitivity this is again quite a cool thing to know your acl basically has a lot of mechano receptors on it and they basically are sensitive to perturbations like i mentioned in the earlier slide if your joint is going out of whack the acl is going to sense that there's going to be a stretch on the acl because the joint is going out of whack so for example by by out of whack i mean going into excessive range of motion i apologize for that excessive range of motion so if your tibia is translating forward way too much it's going to put a stretch on your acl the mechano receptors are going to panic they're going to send signals to the brain and make sure the hamstrings activate fast now this activation pattern this sensitivity this chain of motor pattern is slower in females than in males unfortunately and this is what we need to work on these are the neuromuscular factors which we just covered and all of them can be worked on like we can like we will see in the later slides i will cover all of this so don't worry last one is your biomechanics so biomechanics is basically how are we moving in space what is happening what sort of strategies is a female using when cutting or landing generally speaking we are not um triple flex uh, we are not uh flexing at your at our ankles our hips and our knees adequately to dissipate the forces that are coming from the ground we are more erect secondly there's more hip internal rotation probably because of the q angle like we discussed before or probably because of a flat foot landing on a on a fixed foot landing and then uh, like we discussed before lateral trunk displacement 
um, the ability of your body, uh, uh, the ability to actually control the acceleration and deceleration of your upper limb is very, very important. And generally, these are the faults that you would see in a faulty um, kinematic pattern. The resultant joint action is your knees taking majority of the force as opposed to the hip and foot doing the majority of the uh, work. And what happened before because of that is there's going to be massive amounts of torque and massive amounts of friction and massive risk of rupturing your ACL. So very, very important to correct your biomechanics. OK, last one is solutions. What works? What do you want to do to reduce these risk factors? OK, first things is identify early. So you ask yourself, you, if, if you're an athlete yourself, if you're having an ACL niggle yourself, ask yourself, uh, questions around what's my body fat percentage like? Am I am I more on the heavier side, or do I have enough lean mass? Uh, what are my strength levels like? Am I able uh, to squat two times my body weight, for example? Uh, thirdly, look at neuromuscular efficiency. How is my firing pattern like? Have I checked it? Maybe I haven't checked it. Go to a physio. Go to a coach. Get it checked. And obviously, biomechanics. Do I have a dynamic valgus do I have a dynamic Q angle? Um, also about hormones, uh, just check if you're going to play uh, during your period. You need to check that as well. You need to be as prepared as possible. Why am I saying all of this? Because I don't believe in injury prevention. You can never prevent an injury. And like Tim Hewitt is saying over here, you can transform the black swan, which is the injury, into a gray swan, which is reduce the risk of injury. You can't completely prevent the injury. I'll give you my own example. When I did my first ACL, I had no exposure whatsoever to strength training or any of these factors. I was not aware at all. But after, the, after my first injury, I met the right people. I started strength training. My strength went up. And... When I did my second knee injury, it was three years after my first injury, and my second knee injury wasn't as bad in magnitude as my first one. My first one, I ruptured my ACL completely. Um, I ruptured my meniscus, my cartilage, my MCL, everything was gone. Whereas during the second time, it wasn't as bad. It was just my ACL that needed to be fixed. Where am I getting to with all of this? What I'm trying to say here is, because I did, in those three years of time, because I did a lot of strength training, I probably reduced the magnitude of my injury, but I could not prevent it. Maybe the day when I got injured, maybe I did not sleep well. Maybe I had my period. Um, maybe I was fatigued. Maybe I was overtrained. It could be anything, anything at all. So just remember, guys, it's not injury prevention, it's injury reduction. Moving on. What can we do to reduce or, let's say, prevent uh, injuries? <laughs> um, we have to go through it in a holistic approach. We can't just uh, pick and choose one or the other. We have to address all the risk factors and come up with a holistic plan. So here I have a pyramid um, with three levels. Level one being your base. So in your base, what you need to do is build a strong, strong, strong level of strength, a strong level of neuromuscular efficiency, which is basically your balance and coordination. Once you have built a strong base, then you can move on to explosive performance, which is basically how fast can you produce the force that you have built over here. And then lastly, how efficient are you to bring this and this into a game situation? This is the last part of your rehab to say. So strength and neuromuscular efficiency, building the base. What are my general strength training recommendations like? Um, firstly, you need to have a goal 
of of uh, a relative strength of 1.5 to 2 times body weight what does that mean you should be able to squat uh, 1.5 to 2 times 2 times your body weight more than 2 times your body weight of a deadlift and probably 1 to 1.2 times your body weight of a bench press those are the minimum strength standards that any female should look for any any female um, secondly you need to uh, disperse your training and distribute um, high load heavy lifting and light load sorry i meant to say light load high rep work and heavy load low rep work throughout the year so what do i mean by that you start with a ton of reps build a lot of um, work capacity strength endurance work on your movement quality and all of that good stuff and as you start building a good base of strength endurance you start going towards more heavy lifting which is um your big three generally your big three or squat bench deadlift add your single leg knee dominant exercises single leg hip dominant exercises low back your core and all of that jazz um just a quick um fact over here so this guy dr michael yeses is a very famous Russian sports psychologist, so sports scientist, who basically mentions in his one by twenty program. So basically, his program one by twenty, the very famous program, where you're doing thirty exercises, just one set each of twenty repetitions. And according to him, uh, doing a lot of high volume work, twenty reps or more, is actually good for your avascular structures because that helps in providing a lot of blood. Uh, to your avascular structures so the more the blood flow the more nutrition to your ligaments and your tendons and the healthier your joints are going to be and the better your base is going to be to then build up your force producing capacity i thought that was pretty cool so i thought i would add that over here uh, for more information check out this article by dr yeses it's quite interesting and then moving on to neuromuscular efficiency like I've discussed before, how efficient your brain is, your neurons are, how efficiently your neurons are able to recruit um, all your muscle fibers, um, how how efficient your ligament is to communicate with your brain and all of that stuff. If you want to improve all of that, strength training is your best answer. Strength training is going to work on all of the things that I just mentioned. It's going to work on intermuscular coordination, your intramuscular coordination, uh, your force producing capacity, and, um, and it's going to build a good base for power development later on. Alongside, highly, highly recommended is uh, the neuromuscular programs that are up online in the market, like the FIFA 11 plus, the most, the first one that came in the market, Harmony, Clip, and all of this. If you want to have a closer look at all of these programs, check this article out. You will find tons of literature on these programs, and it's been proven time and again that these programs done frequently, so say twice or thrice in a week as a part of your warm up, helps in reducing chances of ACL rupture by 60%. 60% is a lot. Okay, once you've built a strong base of strength and neuromuscular efficiency, we work on uh, your force producing cap capacity, but producing the force fast. What do I mean by that? I mean rate of force development. How fast are you able to produce force? How fast are you able to reach your force production capacity, your max force production capacity from zero to say um, one hundredth of a second? Why is that important? Because most of your sports happen in the first um, 50 to say about 150 milliseconds. Think about sprinting, think about uh, think about your passing, think about your tackling, think about dodging a defender. All of that happens very, very rapidly. And if you're not able to restabilize that, that joint, produce enough force to stabilize that joint, that ligament, sorry, that bone, in that short amount of time, you're gonna injure. You're gonna increase your chance again of getting injured. So, general recommendations on how to build your rate of force development. 
um do a lot of weightlifting so your snatches cleans and jerks and your weightlifting derivatives so your clean pulls your hang uh, your uh, your snatch pulls hang clean pulls hang snatch high pulls and all of those good stuff there's a lot of research literature on improving rate of force development with these activities along with obviously your sprints jumps and throws and most importantly pre planned landing and cutting this is the next step uh, to build on to your final step which i will discuss in the next slide so pre planned landing and cutting is basically your biomechanics of change of direction your biomechanics of double leg jump double leg land single leg jump single leg land and all of those and all of those um, activities uh, specific to your sport make sure you have a good coach who knows their stuff inside out and who's able to um, correct your biomechanics soundly okay last one neurocognitive performance sounds like a very uh, heavy term but it actually means are you able to i'm just going to go back to the pyramid again so are you able to produce a lot of force produce a lot of force fast and produce a lot of this force fast in a chaotic environment that is the last part of your acl rehab or your injury reduction uh, protocol okay what does this mean situational awareness sensory integration okay let me just give you an example say i have a ball and i'm running with a ball situational awareness would mean am i aware of what's going on yes i am i am attacking um where am i am i close to the touch line am i close to uh they go line am i close to our danger zone where are uh, my fellow teammates are they close to me can i pass the ball to them all of that is situational awareness second thing is your sensory integration and motor planning so for example there's a defender coming in front of me i'm thinking to myself is the def- where where are the defender's shoulders where is she going is she going to go left okay then i'm going to step on the left and cut across to my right as as i start getting closer as i start getting closer say about 2 meters from the defender this is where i'm going to coordinate all of this and execute my athletic maneuver and i'm either going to fail or i'm going to go through this is what is neurocognitive performance you are in the center your execution is in the center individual constraints is basically what are your qualities as an individual how fast are you how agile are you how powerful are you um secondly environmental constraints like i said where you are on the field um where is the defender where are your other teammates and then task constraints so what am i going to do am i going to step am i going to go into a tackle sorry i'm just giving an, a rugby example this can be applied to any other sport any of your sport so the ability to execute this spontaneous behavior um with high accuracy is what you want to reach at in the end how do you train that you start from like i mentioned before you start from pre planned landing and cutting which will come in your sterile environment you slowly start moving into a less sterile environment maybe add a bit of reaction where your coaches are giving you instructions and you and you're reacting to your coach's instructions and then slowly eventually you move on to a chaotic situation which would be a full game and that's how um you're going to end your acl um risk mitigation plan in the end with a neurocognitive performance okay last part a quick summary of what all we've learned today and then we're going to go through question and answers if you have any we went through the issues uh, that are generally faced by a female athlete we went through the anatomy of the female athlete the q angle uh, the static q angle and the dynamic q angle joint laxity how females are more lax than males what do we need to do about that 
or oh, we'll talk about the solutions later. Uh, the femoral notch, which is again a structural defect, and the smaller ACL because of the smaller femoral notch, uh, body composition differences between males and females, um, especially after puberty. That was your anatomy. Second one is hormonal issues. So the increase in joint laxity during your period and then um, effects of estrogen um, on uh, increasing your fat mass uh, after puberty at the onset of puberty. Third one was your neuromuscular factors, which are totally in your control. Um, under that, we covered a multi um, multiple number of factors under the timing of muscle activation, overactive muscles, and underactive muscles. So your quads to hamstring ratio, uh, your ACL sensitivity, um, the effect of fatigue, and all of that stuff. I will send you the PowerPoint later if you want. So don't worry if you don't remember any of these points. And lastly, biomechanics, nice and easy. If you have faulty landing, jumping, or cutting techniques, you need to fix that. Solutions for that, first and foremost, early identification of your problems. Do, you, do I have a dynamic angle present? What's my fat mass like? Is my period coinciding with my tournament? If it is, then I need to uh, make sure I'm well prepared in terms of my strength. Have I been strength training lately? Are my strength levels optimal uh, to be able to uh, combat uh, the effect of lax joints, the, the probable effect of lax joints during my period. And also, I need to make sure I'm doing some sort of a neuromuscular program in my warm up to wake that brain up and those neurons and those firing patterns nice and sharp. Secondly, get strong. I can't emphasize enough on the importance of strength training for women um, to counteract pubertal side effects like we discussed. Uh, the effects of estrogen on joint um, laxity, the effects of estrogen on uh, uh, fat gain. Both of those can be combated with strength training because strength training is going to help in production of testosterone. If you have uh, testosterone flowing, if you have testosterone excreting um, during your puberty, it's obviously going to help in mitigating these effects to some extent. I would love to see more research come out of this, come come out on this topic. Um, neuromuscular efficiency, like we discussed, getting strong is going to help you um, in building your neuromuscular efficiency as well as your biomechanics. And again, like I said before, make sure you have a good coach to teach you all of this. Coming to neuromuscular again, your your interlimb coordination, your intermuscular coordination, how fast are you producing force? And obviously taking all of this in a chaotic situation, are you able to survive in a chaotic situation? That's the main goal of all of this presentation. Okay, and the, the last one is biomechanics. Um, if you do, if you follow a sound strength and neuromuscular training program with a good coach, chances are high that your biomechanics are going to get corrected automatically. OK, that's that's us for today. I just want to thank a couple of people uh, who have spent the past years uh, picking their brains and just learning from them. Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, who has operated on both my knees, I've learned um, a lot of things from him, uh, my physio and as well as my lecturer at one point, Dr. Anand Gangwal, Dr. Vaibhav Daga, uh, Dr. Rakesh, all of you, I've learned a lot from you guys. And if you have um, any problems while you're in Pune, I think these would be the go-to persons um, for you. I'm sure there are a lot more uh, good doctors in Pune or anywhere in, in India, but these are the ones that I got in touch with. And these are the ones that I learned all my ACL stuff from. So that's why I'm putting out these names. And of course, um, Spencer Mackey, he is the head of strength and conditioning at Inspire Institute of Sport. He has a ton of experience in ACL rehab. Um, he's done ACL rehab for most of 
um, our Indian wrestler like Vinesh Fogart, um, Babita, Babita Fogart, Pooja Dhanda and all of them. And all of them are in top notch thanks to him. Learned a lot from these guys. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact them. I'm sure they'll be more than happy uh, to help you with your uh, issues. Uh, that's us for today. Lastly, I want to thank uh, Institute of Sports Science and Technology for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my knowledge. Uh, thanks, Vipul. Thanks, Sunil. I hope you guys have learned uh, something. I hope this will help you uh, take away some important points. And together, we will be able to hopefully reduce, <laughs> not prevent, um, the prevalence of ACL injuries in women. Thank you very much, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me on Facebook. Um, if you want um, this presentation, just let me know and I'll send it through. Oops, sorry, I'm just reading this now. Um, is Xenia, no athlete is truly tested until they started an injury in the face and came out on the other side stronger than ever. Very true, very true. Priceless, priceless knowledge shared. Thank you, Sunil. I'm glad I could help. Given the same ACL injury, who recovers faster, male or female? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I actually don't have an answer to this at this moment. I think the best person's, uh, person to ask would be um, someone who is more experienced in this, to be honest, to so probably Spencer or like Dr. Tapasvi or some of the big names in ACL injury. But in my experience, um, if you stick to the plan and you go according to the plan and you give the right um, dosage of strength and neuromuscular control and if you do everything according to plan, um, I don't think there's going to be much of a difference between recovery in a male and a female. I, I don't I don't really think there would be a, a difference. What are the core areas of focus on your judokas? Core areas of focus on my judokas is obviously uh, strength, power, a lot of rotational power, a lot of single leg work, a lot of upper body pushing and pulling. So I want my judokas to be brutally strong in their pushing and pulling so that they're able to uh, dominate um, their ukis, so their opponents, um, opponent's body around the mat. And secondly, I need their lower bodies to be strong and explosive because that's where all the all the power from the throw is generated from. So if you have a strong lower body, if you have a powerful lower body and a strong lower body and a strong core, you're obviously going to be able to throw very, very, uh, with, with a lot of impact. Very informative webinar, thanks. Uh, thank you. Ujwala Lunawat, thank you. Uh, Vishal, can we have a discussion on getting started with career in the field of sports management in terms of how you choose to study the subjects you did in AUT and how it went on from there? Oh, yes, yeah, sure, we can have a discussion on this, uh, but I'm not too sure I understand your question because the first part of your question says sports management. Sorry, I have not done sports management. I have done strength conditioning. We can definitely talk about uh, what subjects I chose and what I did after that. Please feel free to contact me and we can discuss later. Rishabh Gupta, does laxity during periods only affect ACL? No, uh, like I mentioned, it's definitely going to affect uh, the ligaments uh, around your pelvis. I'm not too sure about other ligaments, I, uh, but definitely the pelvis ligaments. But I suppose... I suppose all your ligaments would have uh, these sex hormone receptors. But I would need to do a little bit more research on this and get back to you. I hope that answers your question. Um, Mr. Rahul, does climatic change make a difference in an athlete's performance and results in a sudden unexpected injury, even if he or she has taken care of all the factors you have mentioned? Climatic change. What sort of climatic change are you talking about? Um, is it is it rain and sun? Yes, obviously, if you're not used to 
playing in the sun it's probably going to play with your uh it's going to play with your mindset it's going to play with your brain and it's probably it might cause it might cause you for a sudden unexpected injury uh maybe this is more related to sports psychology than physiology uh vipul amazing insights thanks a lot vipul i had a great time vishal any chance is it possible to have a one on discussion with you to discuss few queries i have related to sports management i do not know anything about sports management to be honest i know for a fact that sports management aut is quite decent and aut as a university is one of the top universities in the world so maybe we can have a discussion just send me a facebook message and we can see what we can do i think that's about it with the questions uh thanks a lot guys i had a great time um i hope you learned something new and i'm signing off now please contact me if you need anything ciao